Hello, Long Branch Baptist Church. And I hope you're persevering in the Word. And God willing, we'll be able to meet uh, according to His time and according to His will. And at this time, I'd like to pray for Sherry Kea, whose mother passed away on Friday. So please join me as we pray. Heavenly Father, we pray right now for Sherry and her family that you will continue to shower her with your love and mercy. And continue to use us as your hands and feet to mourn with those who mourn. And we pray, O oh God, as we get into your word, that you will search our hearts. Forgive us for our sins. We give you all our distractions. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So I used to be a key holder at Eddie Bauer Retail. A key holder is someone who basically takes care of the store when the manager's not there. I, I would open the store. I would close the store. And I remember one morning, you know, I prepared this beautiful breakfast. I took a shower, got my hair gelled, you know, got my clothes ready, and I put so much effort in preparing for work. And then I showed up to work, and I, I realized I left the key at home, the key to open the door, the key to open the office. So all that effort and preparation meant nothing, because when I showed up, I couldn't get in. If I can't get in, I can't work. This is what Paul is saying in today's passage. You could put all your effort into the gifts, but without the key, without love, it means nothing. The motive and reason why we use our gifts is because we love God and we love others. That's what I wanted to share with you today. Without love, our gifts mean absolutely nothing. And I'll be preaching from 1 Corinthians chapter 13. Today is part one. Next week will be part two. Part one includes point number one, 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 1 to 3. Love is the motivation behind the gifts. And next week, point number two, verses 4 to 7, love is an action. Point number three, verses 8 to 13, love never fails. This is the famous passage on love. It's usually preached during weddings, especially verses 4 to 7. But within this context, Paul is talking about the gifts. There was so much division within Corinth in regards to the gifts. Paul said, this is how you must love each other. Reminding the Corinthians that without love, our gifts mean nothing. You can still apply this though to every relationship, including marriage. And in today's passage, Paul says our motive behind the gifts, why we use our gifts is to build up the church because we love the church. And what is this love that Paul is talking about? It is a love in where we can love even our enemies, the ones who hate us and persecute us. Again, this love is not a love that ignores sin, but discipline is a sign of God's love. Revelation chapter 2, verse 4 to 5, Jesus talking to the church in Ephesus. He says, you have abandoned your first love. Therefore, repent. It's so easy to fall in love with the things of this world, money, ourselves, pleasure. But we must repent. And as believers in Christ, our first love is Jesus. And this love is not a sexual love. There's obviously aspects of that within the context of marriage. But it's not just this romantic type of love. But it is a self-giving and a sacrificial love. And it is unnatural to love our enemies. But we, we can't do this. But empowered by the Holy Spirit, we are able to love even our enemies. And there's two extremes to avoid. The first extreme is the person who has right theology, but no love. The other extreme is the person who has so much love, but no theology and no gospel. But the gospel is actually both. We must have a right understanding of the gospel, but we must also have love for God and love for others. So this is the love that Paul is talking about. Without love, our gifts mean nothing. So again, that's what I wanted to share with you today. Without love, our gifts mean absolutely nothing. Firstly, love is the motivation behind the gifts, verses 1 to 3. Verse 1, if I speak in the tongues of men or of angels, but do not have love, I am only a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. 
tongues. I've already mentioned this in my previous sermons, and I'll be mentioning this in chapter 14. But this was a major source of conflict within Corinth. They were boasting about their tongues. And in 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 18, Paul says, I'd rather speak five words to instruct the church than 10,000 words in a tongue. And within this context, they were using tongues to praise God. But Paul said, if there's no interpreter, how does that edify the church? So in Corinth, they were boasting about their tongues. This was causing division. On top of that was more division in regards to the Lord's Supper, the man living in sin and factions. They missed the whole point of the gifts, which was to edify and build up the church. Paul's saying, your tongues without love is nothing but a noise. It's a resounding gong, a clanging cymbal. I remember at one time, I was actually on a praise team. This was a smaller church, and the praise leader asked me, hey, Alex, you want to play drums? And I could just play the basic beat, and I was playing drums. I was clanging on the cymbal. I was offbeat. I was just making noise. One of the most embarrassing moments of my life, the praise leader actually asked me, can you step down during praise and worship in the middle of a worship service? That's how bad I was. I was distracting people. I wasn't edifying the church. I was just making noise. That's what Paul was saying to the Corinthians. Without love, you're just a noise. You're distracting people from worshiping God. You're no longer edifying the body. You know, sometimes when I walk with Kayan, he brings a bucket and a shovel. Why? He looks for snails. And he can't find snails. You know what he does? He starts banging the bucket. He's bored. He wants attention. Look at me. So the whole neighborhood is going, what's that sound? But that's what's going on in Corinth. They're saying, look at me. They didn't realize the motive behind the gifts was not to bring attention to ourselves, but to build up the church and bring attention to Christ. They didn't realize the motive behind the gifts, again, was love. In the culture of Corinth, Corinth, remembering, was a city in the Roman Empire. And it was all about being wise and having knowledge and being able to speak well about your reputation. It was very selfish. Bringing attention to yourself, building up your great name and wealth. And this attitude seeped into the church in Corinth. I remember I was part of Campus Crusade for Christ, which is now Power to Change. We were sharing the gospel on the streets. I was with a team, and we were talking to these cult members. And I remember my attitude was so wrong. My my motivation was to show off to my teammates, look at me, look how smart I am. And my goal was to tear apart these cult members, to say, look, look how wrong you are. And the things I was saying was right, but my motivation behind it was wrong. It wasn't done in love. And again, I want to clarify this love. What is this love that Paul is talking about so there's no misinterpretation? It's not this lubby-dubby love. It's not a love based on emotions and feelings. It's not a Barney type of love. I love you, you love me. It's not a kumbaya type of love. There's a famous preacher out there. He said, you know what? It's all about love. There's no hell. It's all about love. So according to this preacher, there's no need to put tr your trust in Jesus Christ. There's other teachings out there that say, you know what? Everybody goes to heaven. It's all about love. Everyone goes to heaven. So according to this teaching, Jesus died for nothing. According to this teaching, the cross means nothing. The death upon the cross, the sacrifice, it means nothing. You can just live in sin. Everybody goes to heaven. The Bible is clear. That is not the love that Paul is talking about in this passage. The Bible says God is a just God. He is a holy God. If God did not punish sin, He would no longer be a just and holy God. If God turned a blind eye to sin, what kind of God would He be? He would be a liar. The Word says God punishes sin. But if God decides, hey, I changed my mind, everybody goes to heaven, that means God has no integrity and no character. So what is this love that Paul is talking about? 
we learn this from the gospel, that God sent His Son. Why? Because He loved us. It is clear that it was because of our sin that we were deserving of an eternity of hell. But when we repent, put our trust in Jesus Christ, we are saved for eternity. Saved and we'll spend an eternity in heaven. When we put our trust that Jesus died upon the cross, taking the penalty for our sin, that He rose from the grave, that He is sitting at the right hand of the Father, and that He is coming back, this is true love. That we were deserving of hell, yet Christ took the punishment for us. It's not that God turned a blind eye to sin and gave us a free pass. It's that God gave us His Son who took the punishment for us. And this is where we learn true love. True love is not turning a blind eye to sin, remembering sin needs to be addressed. We're not perfect. I'm not talking about this nitpicking your, your tie's crooked, your shoelace is crooked. I'm not talking about that, addressing sin in that way. But Paul makes it clear in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, there was a person that needed to be addressed. It was a public sin that was hurting the church, hurting the reputation of Jesus Christ. For example, if I was addicted to crack cocaine as your lead pastor, again, there's forgiveness there's mercy, but as your lead pastor, if someone saw me outside, I've just damaged the reputation of Christ. So the outs now it's public. The outsiders know it, and within the church, they know it. And what if I got up on the pulpit and I said, you know what, so don't get me wrong, there's still forgiveness, but as your lead pastor, I get up on the pulpit and I say, hey, I'm sorry. I'm sorry I, I smoke crack cocaine. And the next month, I do it again and people saw me. That's not repentance. So what should you do? You need to address it. You need to get rid of me. Getting rid of me doesn't mean you hate me. It means that you love me. Why? Because I'm putting my life in danger and I'm also putting the safety of the church, the spiritual health of the church in danger. If you truly love me, you would address it with me. That's love. And it's sad that the world has twisted the meaning of love. They think that hate is love. And they think hate is love. They, they turned it around. They turned the truth into a lie. And they've taken the lie and turned it into the truth. Isaiah chapter 5, verse 20 says, Woe to those who call evil good and good evil, who put darkness for light, and light for darkness, who put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. They have twisted the scriptures. They are deceived. Romans chapter 1 verse 25 says, They exchanged the truth of God for a lie. The world has traded in the truth of God for a deception. And because of that, Romans chapter 1 verse 18 to 32 says, God has given them over. To their lusts and we can see that in the world today because they have traded in the truth for a lie God has given this world up to their lusts and because of this the wrath of God is coming that's a scary thing and that's found in Romans chapter 1 verse 18 we live in this illusion that life is comfortable there's so much peace in a sense COVID is dying down. Humans, we're so smart. We found we're going to find the cure for COVID. There's this illusion, especially in North America, that life is happy-go-lucky. We have so much wealth, so much family and friends, and so many material things. But we forget, even as Christians, that the wrath of God is coming. Romans chapter 1, verse 18 to 32. You know, just as do... In 30 days and she has an emergency bag we have a bag packed and ready to go so that when she goes in labor we just grab that bag we go to the hospital hospital in the last birth with Kaya I was actually preaching a sermon on a Sunday in my old church 
And during my sermon, I said, we need to be ready. Jess is ready. She can give birth anytime in the same way. We need to be ready because we can die any moment. During the sermon, Jess actually began to go into the first steps of labor. So right after that sermon, we ran to the hospital. Two hours later, Kaya was born. In the same way, we as Christians, our bags need to be packed. I'm not talking about material things because you can't bring that to you, bring that with us. We can't bring that with us to heaven. But we need to be ready spiritually. We need to be right with God. Why? Because the wrath of God is coming. But praise God that there is an escape. There is hope. There is an answer. There is forgiveness. There is mercy and grace at the cross of Jesus Christ. Remembering that grace is not a license to sin, to just do whatever you want to do, just live in sin. True repentance is to turn away from our sins. And I want to encourage you to make that decision. If you never made a decision to put your trust in Jesus Christ, I want to encourage you to do that today. I remember grade 12 was one of the hardest years for me because there was an inner battle. There was a war going on inside of me for all of grade 12. Satan and sin in the world was pulling me this way. God was pulling me this way. My mom and my grandma, they were praying for me. I wanted to go all in for Christ, but I also wanted to go all in to sin. I had to make a decision. I want to encourage you to make that decision today. So again, the world has twisted that word love to mean something else. It's all about romance. It's all about emotions. In some cases, some churches have even taken that word love to mean, you know what, let's just, there's no such thing as sin. And it's sad that some churches in the world, they have threw out that concept of sin right out the window. Anything goes within that church. So again, within that context of chapter 5, there was a public sin. The person was unrepentant. It was clear they were damaging the reputation of Christ. They were hurting others. It had to be dealt with. So this is the love that Paul is talking about in verse 1. If I speak in the tongues of men or of angels, but do not have love, I'm only a resounding gong or clanging cymbal. In the next sermon, I'll go into that deeper. What is love exactly? It is patient. It is kind. It does not become envious. It's not boasting. It's not arrogant. It's not rude. It does not insist in its own way. It's not irritable. It's not resentful. It does not rejoice in evil, but rejoices with the truth. Verse 2. If I have the gift of prophecy and can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have a faith that can move mountains but do, does, but do not have love, I am nothing. You could be the greatest preacher in the world, be a gifted speaker, have oratory skills. You can have the ability to teach and explain the mysteries of the Bible, but if it's not done in love, it means nothing. There's many preachers, especially in the States, who have fell. And when they fell, it was revealed they were just doing it for their own reputation and their image. They were preaching for all the wrong reasons. Just last week, one of the most famous evangelicals in our world fell into scandal. There's such a temptation for preachers to preach light, to take out sin, to take out wrath, to make it fuzzy and cute, to just preach sermons that will fill seats. But the gospel is not too popular. Even within the evangelical church, the gospel is not very popular. John chapter 6, verse 66, the people that are following Jesus, they say, I'm out of here. Your teaching is too hard. The gospel is too hard. I'm gone. If the preacher truly loved his people, he would preach the truth because only the truth of the gospel can save us from hell. So the preacher's motive is not just more people in the church, more numbers, more money, but it is to see souls saved. That's what it means to love God and love others. It says in verse 2, If I have faith that can move mountains, but do not have love, I am nothing. I remember hearing this story that my friend used to share with me about how he would evangelize in all these you know, tough places. 
He had such faith. He had such boldness. He was telling me a story of him and his friend went to share the gospel with a psychic. So again, before you do anything like that, talk to your pastors and elders. But they were walking up the stairs to this psychic place and you can hear, he was telling me you could hear the steps just creak, right? Creak, creak, creak. It was like a movie. There was two doors and you see the people, a guy was staring at them. And then all of a sudden, that this other door opens. The guy says, get lost, get out of here. And I remember thinking, wow, I wish I had the faith to do stuff like that. But even that, if it's not done in love, if it's just done to show off, it means nothing. I remember my friend was telling me about their church and their leader was so bold and so much faith. They went to the Scarborough Bluff. So if you're familiar with Scarborough, They have a place called the Bluffs. It's a beautiful beach with cliffs. And there's a way to actually get on top of those cliffs. And that church was worshiping. And the leader randomly, so my friend was telling me this, the leader randomly just said, you know what, I'm jumping off the cliff. God's going to catch me. So according to my friend, he just jumped, screaming, right? Jesus! And he just jumped off the Bluffs. And according to the story, he actually got wedged in between two rocks. So he jumped and he got wedged. They called, they had to call 911 and they had to get the fire truck, the, you know, the firefighters to get him out. And I remember saying to myself, wow, I wish I had that type of faith to jump off the Scarborough Bluffs. Can you imagine the headlines? Lead pastor of Long Branch Baptist Church jumps off the bluffs and gets wedged in between two rocks. You know, my wife would kill me if that didn't kill me itself. But who cares about stuff like that? If it's not done with the right motivation, out of love, just to be just doing it to be famous, it it means absolutely nothing. Verse three, if I give all I possess to the poor and give over my body to hardship that I may boast If I do not have love, I gain nothing. This verse is not saying that we shouldn't give. We still have to give to to those who need, give our tithes and offerings. In Luke chapter 19, Jesus talking to the tax collector named Zacchaeus. He was rich. He was a tax collector. And the Jews hated the tax collectors because the tax collectors were Jews who worked for the Roman Empire. And they would actually cheat their brothers and sisters. They would take more money than was necessary. But this tax collector repented. And he gave back to those he defrauded. And in chapter 19, verse 8, it says he restored it fourfold. His actions proved he truly repented. He didn't just say sorry. He made things right. So this is not just about giving money. Okay, I've given my money, so I repented. But he made things right. Those who he wronged. It is on repentance, is an ongoing behavior that continues into the future. That is repentance. So again, we should still give like Zacchaeus, but we don't want to be like the Pharisees. In Luke chapter 18, verse 9 to 14, the parable of the, par- of the Pharisee and the tax collector, the Pharisee started to boast, I'm holy, not like the sinners. I don't commit adultery. I fast. I tithe. The tax collector instead cried. He beat his chest. God have mercy upon me in humility. So when we give, we don't boast. Hey, look at all the money I'm giving to the church. If it's not done in love, it means nothing. Matthew chapter 6 verse 1 to 4 says, When you give to the needy, don't announce it with your trumpets. They've already received their reward. That praise of man, that's their reward. It says, when you give, don't let your left hand know what your right hand is doing and God will reward you. So again, we still give to those in need. We still give our tithes and offerings, but we do it with the right motive because we love God. When it says in verse 3, give over my body to hardships, hardship that I may boast by Do not have love, I gain nothing. The ESV uses the phrase, deliver up my body to be burned. So even martyrs. For me, the greatest honor is to die for Jesus Christ. 
Psalm chapter 116, verse 15 says, Precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of His saints. Revelations chapter 6, verse 9 to 11, it says, The fifth seal was opened, and the souls of the ones who had been slain for the word of God and for the witness they had borne cried out, and they were told to be patient until the number of their fellow servants should be complete. Those who were to be killed for Christ. It is an honor to die for Jesus Christ. And many have. And I think about Jim Elliot. And even to this day, when I hear the story of Jim Elliot, I get goosebumps. I get motivated. I get passionate, even more passionate for the gospel. Jim Elliot and his four friends, they went to South America. They went to a tribe that never heard the name of Jesus. And they got killed. They got speared. And in this story, Jim Elliot's wife and some others actually went back to the tribe that killed her husband and eventually led many of, that, many of those people to Christ. What a story. And Jim Elliot is most famous for this phrase. He didn't He didn't um, make this phrase up. It's from someone else, but he's most famous for this phrase, which is, he is no fool who gives up what he cannot keep our our temporary lives to gain what he cannot lose, talking about eternal life. Jim Elliot had a 10-month-old daughter. Yet, he was willing to die. There's so many stories about people who became missionaries to these countries where if you get caught, you will get killed. There is high risk. They have such boldness. I remember hearing this story about a man. He says he has no purpose in life. He hates life. He lost everything. There's nothing to cling to. His heart was broken. But he became a missionary to these countries that where you get, if you get caught, you will get killed. And he said, I have found so much meaning in life now. I'm so encouraged by these stories. And God has used these people like Jim Elliot in mighty ways. But even these things, if they're not done in love, they mean nothing. I always thought the greatest thing you can do to show people you are dedicated to Christ is to die for Christ. But again, If their motive is not out of love, love for God and love for others, to see people saved from an eternity of hell, but if it's just to become famous, it means nothing. Sometimes it's easier to die for Christ than to live for Christ. Especially in North America, we say, I'm definitely not going to die for Christ. I'm not going to die for Him. That's for sure. But sometimes as Christians, we also say what? I'm definitely not going to live for Him either. I'm just good with the verbal profession. I made a verbal profession of faith. I go to church. I do churchy things. I'm good with that. I don't want to live. I don't want to live for Christ. No way. It's so hard to live for Christ in our culture. In our day, especially with all the temptations, with all the idols, with all the excess of wealth, all the material things, with the easy access to sin, it is actually impossible in our own strength. But what is impossible with man is possible with God. Empowered by the Holy Spirit, we can live for Christ. We're not perfect, but that's not an excuse to just sin, go crazy in sin. And it's not about putting more effort into acting like a Christian. What we need is not an outward conformity, but we need an inward transformation. So when we repent and put our trust in Jesus Christ, our hearts are regenerated, transformed, we are renewed, we are born again. And through the Holy Spirit, we are called to live for Christ. And when we are born again, we have the Holy Spirit and we are given gifts of the Spirit. And we use these gifts because we love God and we love each other. In summary and in closing, 
This concludes part one of the sermon. Without love, our gifts mean nothing. Firstly, love is the motivation behind the gifts, verses 1 to 3. So we serve in love because God first loved us. We were sinners deserving of hell, yet Christ died for us. We're all sinners. There is no one righteous, no, not one. We are saved by grace and not by works. We cannot earn it. That is why we are humbled each day because we cannot earn grace. Yet we have hope that no matter what we are going through today, we are never alone if we are children of God who have repented, put their trust in Christ. God will never leave His child. He is a sovereign God. He can do whatever He pleases. But there is always a purpose in the mystery. Even in the things that we don't understand, it is done for the glory of God. And with Job, we can say in the midst of, his, in the midst of suffering, blessed be the name of our God. No matter the trial, no matter how hard it is for you right now, maybe your heart is broken, maybe you're in the pit, maybe you're losing hope. There is hope because Christ died for us while we were sinners. And if He died for us while we were sinners, will He not be there for us as followers of Jesus Christ? He will never, God will never leave us nor forsake us. Even in the midst of COVID, we want to meet soon. We have that hope. There's so much anxiety and worry and fear. But we have hope because we were separated because of our sin. We are reconciled through the shed blood of Jesus Christ. Jesus fulfilled the requirements of the law. And because of that, we are made righteous. It's Christ's righteousness and not ours. He took the penalty for our sin. But He also broke the power of sin in our daily lives so that we can live for Christ, to turn from sin, to turn from sexual immorality, to turn from ungodly relationships, to stop trying to be like the world, from stop falling into peer pressure. And as believers, we believe in God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, remembering that the Son truly suffered for us. And Jesus is the only true King of kings. I leave this challenge for you, for the believer in Christ. Before you do anything in the church, before you do anything for God, before you serve people, examine your heart. Why do I do what I do? Is it because I love God and love others or is it for selfish reasons to be seen for my reputation, for self-interest? We can also apply this to our day-to-day -day activities. When we work, when we raise our kids, when we do our dishes, when we go for a walk, when we eat, when we pray, when we read the Bible, we examine our hearts. Are we doing these things because we love God and we love others? And also another challenge for the believer in Christ, for those who repent and put their trust in Him, who love God with all their heart, their soul, and their mind, I want to encourage you to read the Bible every day. I want you to, I encourage you, if you're not reading the Word every day, start with Matthew. And just read one chapter every day, or if not a chapter, a section. There's always sec little sections in the Bible to read that every day. Have a notebook and take some notes. Do this by yourself. You can do it with your wife or your, your husband, or you can do it with your family together every night. And do this for the rest of your lives. The goal is eventually your kids will do this with their kids, and their kids will do this with their kids. There are many things that we can teach our kids, but the most important thing is to, that we can teach our kids is to love God with all their heart, their soul, and their mind, and to love the Word. But before we can do that, we better make sure that we love God with all our hearts, our soul, and our mind, and that we love the Word. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, as we get, thank you so much for all that you have done. We thank you for the love that you have poured out into our hearts and we pray that we, we will use this for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless.